would be great. Thanks, okay. Louise. Um, hi everyone, I'm Lucy O'Neill, I'm Head of AI Programs at GSTT and I oversee the AI Centre. So, um, really excited to have you all here today to sort of give you a preview of AID, the AI Deployment Engine, which is one of the sort of two platforms we're developing as part of the AI Centre. So, it's really a celebration of the first big milestone, which is the MVP in King's College Hospital. Um, and obviously this is a collaboration, so we wanted to share this with everyone and sort of show, show you what you'll be getting in your own trust. So thanks very much for coming. Um, and I'll just move on to the agenda now, just to run through everyone that will be talking uh, around different aspects of the programme. So we've got Harish Schwabe, who's the inventor and AI aid product owner, and he'll be talking about um, aid now and sort of what we plan to do in the future. We've got James Teo, who's our clinical lead. He's also part of the team that developed the model that, that we've got on um, aid at the moment, and he'll be doing a live demo. Um, Jawad Chowdhury is our program manager, and he'll be running through the onboarding process we went through at KCH to give sort of an idea of, of what will be happening in your trust. We've got a Q&A, which uh, George Cardoso will be joining as well. He's our CTO and also part of the academic team that developed the model that we have on the MVP at the moment. Um, and then we'll have closing comments from Paul Y, who's a delivery director for Answer Digital, their technology delivery partner. So he'll be he'll be closing the session. So I'm just going to hand over now to Harris, who will be um, talking about aid now and in the future. That's great. Thanks, Lucy. And just before you start, um, Harris, if anybody has just joined. Uh, um... uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, excited to to unveil uh, what we've done so far with aid. Um, so I'm, by way of introduction, um, a consultant physicist and head of clinical scientific computing at, at Guidance and Thomas's. And I'll just be sort of setting the scene, partly reminding us what we were trying to do uh, or what we are trying to do with aid and, and putting it into context um, of uh, AI uh, as a whole in healthcare. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I've got a really boring screenshot, um, but um, James Teo will log in and delve deep in his demo uh, about what we've built so far. And um, what we have built so far is the ability for um, software developers and AI model developers to build composable pipelines, so multi-stage execution of AI algorithm. Um, we've um, set up interfaces to directly integrate with clinical information systems, primarily with PACS at the moment, and we'll be extending that obviously to, to other clinical data and, and other clinical systems in such a way that it integrates seamlessly with the clinical workflow, that in fact, ideally, um, clinicians won't even need to know that aid exists. Um, uh, that's the uh, intended impact of aid, hopefully. Uh, we've also integrated what I think is a, is a key innovation um, when it comes to AI deployment, uh, and it's a clinical review page. And, and that allows us to do several things. Um, it allows us to run AI models in a sort of sandbox environment. Um, one of the crucial aspects and activities when we're going through AI procurement is the ability to do some sort of technical validation. And some of the clinicians on the call hopefully would have had some experience of having to do that, facilitate that, and the difficulties that that introduces. And the, the sort of sandbox environment that aid provides will hopefully facilitate and accelerate those kinds of activities. As well with the clinical review stage, we have the option to deploy slightly more immature technologies, potentially technologies that operate in a in an area of relatively higher clinical risk, and it allows um, appropriate clinicians to step into the system and review results before they are uh, go on to their final clinical destination. So that it allows expert radiologists, oncologists, whoever it might need to be, to review the results and ensure that the quality is correct. Uh, it would also help things like um, clinical trials of AI, which are very few and far between, as well as clinical investigations for, for certification. Uh, and the, the, one of the other things I'm most proud of, and really all of that credit is down to Answer Digital, is the model user experience and user interface. One of the things that I, I hated being a technologist in the NHS is how everything looks like it's been built in 1995. And what we have now is you know, mobile first, web first development framework uh, in a workflow that you'd expect to see in any consumer application, let alone in, in the NHS. 
Next slide, please. And and just to sort of set the scene of where we go from today, uh, and, I, and I want to go go backwards before we go forwards, and I'll, I'll take you back to 1895, and we have uh, the hand X-ray of William Wilhelm Röntgen's wife, and the invention of the X-ray and of radiography technology led to a revolution in healthcare and changed the way we did medicine, uh, obviously, than we did before. And uh, it allowed us to peer into the body and transform pathways around cancer, uh, and neurological conditions and the like. Um, but what really set the transformation on fire when it came to imaging was the digitalization of images and the standardization of storage of transfer of images via the PAC system. And if, if the X-ray was the greatest invention of the last 150 years, then the PACs must be the greatest invention in the last 50 years. And we're at a similar stage with, with medical AI technologies, where a decade ago, we got sort of the first glimpse of what is the art of the possible with deep learning and machine learning when applied to medical problems, things like pediatric bone aging and uh, internal cranial hemorrhage detection, those kind of applications first started coming onto the scene. But what really is required to really transform the way we deliver healthcare is a platform that integrates all of these disparate applications and workflows in a way that allows us to seamlessly integrate it for, for patient benefit. And so a key aspect uh, that will help us scale the platform going forward will be our NHS repository. So we'll have something akin to an app store that will allow all aid trusts to share and distribute models uh, in-house or, or commercial um, and allow us to easily deploy and test those and then integrate those. So then hopefully what we have from the, the clinical review step, the technical orchestration, the, the app store for algorithms is a safe and robust pipeline to, to test and deploy AI algorithms at real scale and, and begin to not only shape the standard of how it's done in the UK, but hopefully internationally as well. So, so that's uh, a summary of the background. I, I now love to hand over to, to Professor James Teo to, to give us a demo from his clinical perspective. Over to you, James. Thanks, Harris. Thank Thank you. I'm just going to do a screen share now um, of the DIVE system. So before we go show you the the the, the aid platform, I'm going to just show you from uh, the inside of our live pack system, which is uh, we use uh, Cetra in King's College Hospital. As you can see, uh, we've, we've, I, uh, I found an anonymous female with a scan in there to to transmit the uh, into aid. So if this is a live system, there are patients who are streaming in right now in NHS Trust with scans appearing in the system. Uh, and this is a particular patient, for example, that we can just select the scan and we can put it to the, the dire directly to the destination. So this is a, a live system. This is not a, um, a something that we, we just do for demo purposes. So then once we transmit it, what we are, we're just going to move to the next uh, window, which you can see here is the is the the web interface of aid. So the web interface of aid, essentially, this is the admin dashboard, which um, I will uh, I will come to last, essentially. So what will hand ends up happening is that, uh, that the, 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 when it's transmitted from the PAC system, it will be passed from model to model to model uh, uh, and uh, orchestrated by the aid system to, to process them along the pipeline. But I'm just going to go to two scans that we have uh, processed through the system here, for example. So those two scans are of two patients with strokes, with uh, bleeding in the brain. And we have partnered with uh, per Professor Parash Kavnachev, who leads out the Welcome Innovations Program involving us developing stroke models for uh, acute stroke uh, using uh, real world data. And these are, uh, are the stroke AI that's used in this uh, has been used to run these uh, uh, the the models on using in aid. So this is, for example, one such patient. So let's have a look at. Oh, let me just get the windowing correct. So this is a patient who, who 
uh, is that anonymous female which went through the system. Um, and this is a, a CT scan of the head uh, for those who are not radiologists here. The white bit is bone. You can see the eyeballs here. Uh, this is the cerebellum, the back of the brain. Uh, and as we scroll, the ears on each side, as we scroll up, you can see that there's a little lump of blood on the surface, uh, which is white here on the surface, uh, on the, uh, the right side of the screen. Now, what happens, as you can see in the report, is that there is a PDF which has been generated by uh, the, the stroke model uh, after being orchestrated through the pipeline, and this thing appears here, and that's, and this uh, report generates a phenotype of, uh, of, of the blood. So but essentially, it labels it with the relevant icon images, and then it highlights the area that, that is orange. So uh, a radiologist concurrently would not have this additional information, and this, this, this mask, this orange mask on top helps highlight it. But not only that, uh, we more significantly, it phenotypes uh, the, the exact locations where it's where, which is affected. It, it, uh, it shows, for, let me just try to zoom in a bit so that we can see that. Uh, scroll down. As you can see here, it, it quantifies these uh, all these numbers. It shows which parts of the brain are affected, which parts of uh, uh, the, the different parts of the structures within the brain. And all this tells us how a patient will uh, Will progress going forward. Uh, all this information is currently not available uh, on the fly to uh, to a neuroradiologist or clinician. So let's just just pick another image. So this is another image here. This is again this is the image that uh, a radiologist would see, which is as you can see here, uh, uh, the whole the whole skull with blood within uh, the the subarachnoid spaces. It's bleeding within. Uh, uh, the ventricles of the brain with CSF uh, accumulation inside uh, and bleeding presumably from a source somewhere around here. And we bring the PDF, which has been generated by the stroke model. And this again, let's just zoom in a bit. It kind of highlights where it thinks the blood is and, it's, and it lo localizes the different locations where it thinks it's affected. And all this information tells us uh, in time when what that patient's likely outcome is going to be, what specific disabilities that they may have uh, in the short term and medium term and long, possibly longer term. Uh, so th these are systems, these are kind of scans which have been processed by AI. Now, if you go to the, the admin dashboard, this is uh, where we, um, we view the different bits of the model, which can then, uh, uh, as you can see over here, let me just pick one of these here, so the pipeline tells you when it was received, uh, it passes on to, the, to a particular uh, thing, to uh, a container to process it into a DICOM, then pre-processing, segmenting the lesion, phenotyping and reporting. And likewise, and you have you know lots of these different models. And so therefore, each of this is like a, a, an app within an app store, which then has to be orchestrated by the aid engine. And this would, uh, and so uh, a liver uh, model would sit in here or a, uh, a prostate cancer model would sit in here, and uh, a chest X-ray model would sit in here, and, and such. So, and this would allow you to all sit within one platform rather than lots and lots of little virtual machines that you that is a, uh, is very difficult to maintain. Uh, the other bit as well is I forgot to mention over here is that after we have reviewed an image, you will have the option of accepting and declining it if we feel that, for example, this was a a, a default a faulty uh, scan or uh, if. We, we can reject it or we can accept it, and then we can. It, this will be transmitted back into the pack system for it to be viewable by uh, by the, everyone else in the live packs. At this stage, obviously, we 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 we're not going to push that back uh, directly to li a live sy clinical systems yet until we the, the models themselves are validated. But this step can obviously be automated as well if we feel that uh, the the accuracy is adequate. So that in summary, that's kind of the summary really of uh, of what. Uh, the minimum viable product of the aid system provides for. As you can see, this is only one model at the moment, but uh, in time you can have uh, as as many as uh, as is as is required, and it, this can process it all and synchronize and uh, orchestrate it. All right, um, that's it from me. Um, um, and I'm going to pass on to someone, the next person in the talk. Great, thank you so much, James. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now so we can get back to the slide deck and hand over to um, to Jawad. I know at King's the um, 
the um, aid was deployed really rapidly, you know, in line with the sort of pro- pro- project plan, which has gone really well. But um, okay. Jawad's now going to talk to you about the onboarding process in a bit more detail. Is that okay, Jawad? Absolutely. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Tuwa Chowdhury. I'm the program manager for the AI Centre. And because I'm a glutton for punishment, I was also the KCH project manager. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to give you a quick bit of a background, as a uh, we, we was previously previously mentioned, um, our implementation was quite rapid. Um, the general implementation time we foresee will be about four months for other trusts. We did out in about a month and a half. Um, we implemented something called a minimal viable product, which is your basic functionality, enough so that the product is usable and functional, but it's not your all singing or dancing. Um, what we will be doing, however, is creating a blueprint so that when we come to the other trusts, we will have an instruction set of exactly what needs to do from an implementation perspective. We want to take as much of the thinking away from you guys as possible so that we can start establishing best practice as we go from each trust. We'll be learning more and providing better, better, better implementation processes. Um, the first thing we did, coming back to KCH, was governance. Um, clearly, it's, it's a, we're implementing a clinical system in a trust, so governance is extremely, extremely important. Um, some of the key governance uh, processes we had to undertake were things like the system level security policy, uh, data protection impact assessments, and we had to obviously go through various change advisory boards when we wanted to do certain implementation points. Um, we had the policies and procedures signed off, um, although it did take a considerable amount of time. Um, and um, But what we are trying to do is creating templates so that when we do come to other trusts and we, we know we have to go through these same processes, we will have all the information ready for the leads in those trusts to be able to just hopefully just pick and drop into their own templates. Um, Part of the system was part of implementing where we had to do some sort of system integration and we did it into packs. Um, there's, got, there's a conversation being had with regards to whether or not the, the live product or the productionized system is integrated with the packs or the modalities themselves, i.e. the scanners. Um, it's a conversation that's ongoing, but by the time we get to the other trusts, we will know which direction we should be taking and we will provide enough time for all, all of these integrations to happen. Um, <clears throat> one of the key things about the project was the resourcing, um, as well as needing someone to organise it, commonly a project manager, um, one of the key things was having clinical support. Uh, Dr James Teo, who kindly did our presentation just now, he was instrumental in all of this. Not only do you need clinical oversight, but also when it comes to testing, um, it doesn't normally follow your a typical testing route. You need someone who has an understanding of clinical pathways, radiology, things that don't normally exist in you know your testing resources so so testing was a big thing and so our clinical our clinicians were paramount in our testing um also as has been again been mentioned earlier by harris um this product is brand new to the nhs and as such support for it is not commonly available we what we've done is we've created a a role we think that will fit called an aid administrator um and that role encompasses multiple things, as well as being third, first, second, third line support for the product. They will also be managing path, the new pathway, algorithm pathways coming in, clinical safety sign-offs, et cetera. As we go to East Trust, we'll be able to sit down with you and go through what these roles look like so that we are able to get them embedded in your trusts. Um, now to some of the boring stuff. Um, one of the key things we do need to watch out for are lead times. Clearly, we're doing things, you know, we have to go through the very governance processes, systems integration, and, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to underestimate how long these things take to sign off. Again, we're going to be giving as much lead time as we can when we go to other trusts, so we know that these things can be signed off in time, but they are things we do really need to look out for. And also, lastly, detail. Detail is essential. Um, when we did ours in the MVP world, you know, we we kept getting, you know, we kept getting lost slightly in some of the detail. We, you know, we need thing, we needed things to find outright and upfront, so that when we were talking to our other suppliers, we were we were able to give them information needed at the right time. Again, as I said earlier, as we go into the other trusts, we should hopefully have all this detail present, so that we can create, give you, give over the leads in those trusts, just work packages to say this is exactly what you want to do. Saying that, I mean, you know, each trust will be different, and we understand that, you know. 
tax systems will be different, etc. So we just need to keep an eye out for those bits of details. Thank you. That's it for me. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jawad. Um, OK, so we are um, we've got a couple of questions to pose. I'm going to just um, take the screen sharing off. Um, so that we can see everybody's faces. And um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, if you have, please raise your hand. I've got a, one or two questions. Um, uh, Rob, thank you. It's a great demonstration, guys. You're doing really, you're doing amazing. But uh, Rob wants to know um, how do developers deploy on aid? I don't know whether that means deploy aid or actually deploy the systems on aid. Rob, I don't know if you want to come in and just. Um, Harris, do you want to come in? Yeah, sure. So um, at the moment, um, the the developers work with the Arthur Digital team to adapt their application to the AID SDK, the Software Development Kit, um, and that ensures that their software is compatible with AID. Eventually, that's going to become sort of a hands-off process where there will be sort of documentation for developers, a bit like developing uh, an app for the iPhone, where you sort of get the documentation of how to do it and you get some software libraries to help you with the integration. And then it's just down to, to the developers to then create the aid app, so to speak. Um, and then there will be a, a central repository that they could upload their app to, a bit like the App Store, that then Trust could download. At the moment, uh, because we don't have the central repository set up, um, it's a bit more of a manual process where we are sort of sideloading the, the applications, but that would be the, the future state. Great. Thank you so much, Harris. Um, we haven't got many other questions going on. However, um, could I just ask if this um, solution, I know we've got many NHS trusts um, within the consortium, but is this currently or will this be open to other NHS trusts who aren't currently in the consortium? Uh, I mean, the way that it's been developed and the onboarding process for the trusts uh, is absolutely something that we could replicate across across the country if, if we needed to. Um, and I think maybe expanding the consortium and, and growing those uh, those sort of date that database that the other system that we haven't spoken about today, Flip, where we're training AI algorithms to get to the point where they could be released on aid. If we're the more trust you've got in there, the more data you're training the AI on. So um, I think I mean George, George or Lucy might want to come in there in terms of expanding the consortium and adding it to trust. But certainly the way we're developing it, um, it, it, it would handle that. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, there is a couple of questions Barbara's asking on the chat. Um, what do you see as the main AI applications outside of imaging? What additional clinical systems will you be targeting for integration beyond the MVP phase? And I mean, I know, Paul, you're going to cover this in the next um, sort of closing comments, but I don't know if um, if Harris or Lucy want to come in with any any comments on that. Ooh. <laughs> Got a bit of feedback there, Harris. Sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's so the the first applications will be imaging mainly because of the standardization within radiology. the The next step is likely to be imaging outside of radiology. Um, so uh, for example, radiotherapy treatment planning, which is image based, um, uh, but for a non radiology application. But eventually, the plan is to target all clinical information systems and all clinical data types as, as inputs and outputs. So the hope is, is that for almost all episodic AI execution, where a patient comes in and has some analysis done, should all be in scope, potentially things around video streaming, potentially pathology, uh, that might be uh, a bit out of scope, um, but everything else we'd imagine would be in scope. Thanks, Harris. Lucy, did you want to come in or, or George? OK, um, there is another question about um, the code. Is the code available um, on public repo yet? I guess it's not, but I might be wrong. Who wants to come in with that? Uh, I, I can answer that quickly. Yes, it, Thanks, it, it will be open sourced. Uh, it's not in its MVP state. Um, we're looking to sort of get that to a mature level before before putting that on a, uh, an open source platform. Do we know when that might be, Paul? sometime next year? 
Uh, oh yeah, certainly so, sometime ne- next year. Yeah. That's probably a safe answer. Yeah. <laughs> <We'll get that. laughs> okay, okay, that's great. Um, thank you. And I'm, I'm I'm assuming all this um, is available. It's kind of um, device diagnos- uh, you know, agnostic. It, it doesn't matter what kind of devices you've got on hardware. You, you know, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, the, so the hardware is being provided uh, through the AI centre, um, and so that we will look to be rolling out into the trust aid centres in over the next few months. We're expecting that to be delivered uh, towards the end of this month, um, and certainly the, the the first couple of sites who are going to be using the flip system will be getting theirs in place before the end of November. Um, in terms of sort of devices that you might use to, to run it, um, so we are doing an uh, analysis on, on the types of devices used in the trust. Uh, we're looking to make sure it supports sort of um, a minimum level that would be acceptable across the trust. Um, but there's always one trust that's using using some strange device <laughs> that we're going to come across. So that, yeah. that analysis will be ongoing, and, and as we onboard the trust, we'll be we'll be learning through that as well. Exactly, and you'd be sharing that um, all the devices that you've used and, and any and any kind of minor glitches, I guess. And there is another question that's just come in um, from Sven. Are there any compatibility requirements for a for products to be used within the aid pipeline? Uh, so I, I think that's sort of touched on what, how, what Harris was saying earlier in terms of us onboarding new models and pathways into that pipeline. So. Uh, at the moment, uh, we do work with each of the model researchers. Uh, the idea being that eventually we'll get to a point where we can start sending out the specification um, and the requirements for using aid to model researchers. So we're, we're we've only got one one model on board at the moment. We're looking to expand that um, expand that list uh, quite rapidly over the next few months. Uh, there is a piece of work ongoing with all the trusts at the moment in identifying the models that you're developing across your trust um oh, i got a little about that um and, and and so through that analysis of understanding what models you're using how do they differ from uh, the other models that people are doing how mature are they where are they in their life cycle and that piece of work is going to give us a sort of a prioritized list of models across the consortium that we can reflect back at the various boards and, and, and meetings to make sure that we're all in agreement what's coming next when's it happening um uh, yeah, and, and have a proper pipeline and, and roadmap of the products. Great, that's great. Thanks, Paul. Um, oh, James has just um, provided a comment as well. The clinical user group has a long list of existing AI models which could be onboarded in the near term and medium term. And I guess, you know, you're looking for the trust to kind of come back on that, James, aren't you? And just sort of, you know, um, uh, just to ask what they what, what they can do and what they want to do and, and there's an opportunity to do that and um, Lucy if people do want to get in touch and ask a little bit more um, if, and ask some more questions sort of offline from this um, they're they're more than more than welcome to kind of contact you and the team aren't they yeah absolutely we have a sort of generic email address um, if, as well but if you if you're not sure just contact me and we can sort of field it I, I I've omitted to include that uh, generic email address in the slide deck I'm very sorry about that if you want to um, type it in the chat that might be useful um, and then everybody's got it as a reminder George <laughs> come yeah. on in the only thing I wanted to say is, is, is to add to what was being said before so the, the, the idea at the moment is that we're working with different model developers but there will be an SDK and that SDK has been designed in a way that is broad enough so that any package or pretty much any package or algorithm that has been developed either by a research institution, hospital, or even a private um, industry partner could deploy within the aid setup. Right? So the idea is that we push for that uh, API and we're actually working externally uh, with other people outside of the consortium uh, with several universities in the US, in Germany, and a few other countries to try to define what that standard would look like in a way that is compatible with multiple uh, use cases and multiple types of users. So by doing all, by putting all of these things together, we're not only having the platform that you can use to run these algorithms, and that's Abe, but also create a standard on how these algorithms should be packaged and wrapped and called so that they can that data can flow through them. Great. Thank you, George. That, that, that's um really clear um i think for everybody um i think now um i'm going to if there's no more questions i can't see any more questions coming up i think paul will i'll hand over to you and you're just going to sort of explain sort of some of the um some of the next steps um in terms of flip because we will be having another webinar in a couple of months to um to demonstrate the flip um system that's coming out soon so just one yeah, moment absolutely. there you go 
Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Louise. Um, so yeah, I, I'm Paul, as, as you have heard. Um, I'm the delivery director at ANSWER, and we're the technology provider to AI Centre, uh, developing Flip and Aid. And I just wanted to use this sort of last five minutes just to talk you through what's coming up in the future, um, and, and also uh, the communities that we're looking to build to make sure that we're all making this um, a success. Uh, so just to start on those communities, um, I've actually touched on a couple of them in, in those questions, to be honest. Uh, so we mentioned the CUG, uh, the clinical user degree that's got a membership from uh, each of the consortium trusts. Um, so uh, in the short term, we're, that, that, that group's being used to um, look at the pathways that have been developed across the trusts and, and do that analysis piece that I mentioned earlier. Um, we'll also be looking to bring things like uh, clinical safety documentation um, to that trust, uh, to, to that group when we've got it, so that the clinical safety representation from the trust are starting to see the clinical safety cases and the hazard logs uh, before we come to you uh, to, to onboard the systems. Um, it's similar with the next one there as well, the data allocation committee or, or the DAC, um, again, has a representation from each of the trusts. Um, and that group is going to get um, into the depths of discussing things like ethical sign-offs and things like that. Um, and just from a, a, a development point of view, we'll be looking to bring things like the, the DPIA and the SSP and other IG and security documentation to that group, again, so that we're surfacing it with the, uh, with the leads for, for, those, um, for those areas at the trust before you, before you start onboarding it. And hopefully really have a sort of a, a group sign-off so that when we arrive at the trusts, um, we're, we're giving you this documentation that you've seen before, and hopefully we've done a lot of the legwork in producing it. And either you can just use that documentation, or you can at least use the, the data within it as a template for, um, for what you guys need to do to get those relevant sign-offs. Um, we're forming special interest groups. So we will have mentioned this at uh, um, a few of the boards and the TDA uh, to date. Um, th these groups are really to help us with the development. So, uh, Joe had mentioned before that they, KCH have gone live with the MVP, the, the minimum viable product. Um, and the idea is that, that we, we rapidly uh, build on that. So, we, we're working in, in an agile way. Every, every couple of weeks, we have a, we have a sprint. Um, and at the end of that sprint, we're hoping to bring more meaningful um, deployment and, and change and functionality to the, to the systems that we're developing. So within those special interest groups, we're, we're looking to form them of the, the various different disciplines and user bases. So, so the flip users, those people who are looking to train, test, and, and build a, AI models. Um, we're looking for aid users. So Jared mentioned the aid administrators for those people who are going to sort of package up the models uh, to be sat there waiting for the trust to deploy them. And, and, and also the people who are actually doing the deployment in the trusts. Um, aid is also a clinical system at the end of its workflow where a message is going to be displayed back to a clinician. Um, so the, the big reason why we're all doing this, uh, and so we want to form a group of, of clinicians who, where we can make sure that that message is, is arriving in a way that would, would make sense and will actually add, um, add value to the, to the healthcare of the patients that they're treating. Um, and the, the last group we're looking at is, is one of um, sort of data integration specialists. So uh, a lot of what we're doing here is uh, aid being triggered by a DICO image or, or data coming into aid to trigger it. Um, the, the is a system flip, which we won't talk about as much today, but we will certainly talk about a lot more over the next few months, um, needs data to train the AI. So those people who are going to be helping provide that data from the, the source trust systems, we want to form a group of those people to make sure that we're standardizing the data in the right way um, and making those integrations work as best as we can. Um, there's also the, the Monai group as well, which is a, a community um, looking to develop open source and, and standardized really uh, frameworks for deep learning and medical imaging. Uh, so both aid and flip will be utilizing some of these frameworks as we move forward and uh, that's an open community uh, run by by harris and george uh, among others uh, on the call today uh, so, so with all these communities uh, that, that's just trying to make sure we're developing the system that's going to work for the, for the end users um, we're we're looking at making sure we're refining things like ethical sign-off uh, ig clinical safety sign-off to make sure that we're able to deliver the systems um, as best and, and efficient as we can uh, to del deliver models into those systems um, ever more efficiently as well. So a lot more to come in those in these groups and there'll be a, a call to arms coming from us um, in the next few weeks to get signed up into these communities. Um, uh, and where we can, we'll, we'll make sure that we're doing a lot of it offline, uh, busy diaries across, across the board really. Um, so where we can, we'll make sure these are offline forums that uh, we can get the, the feedback that we need to make sure that the, the development's going to work for everyone. So next steps, um, we've mentioned the second one already, uh, so pathways and models across the consortium. This is the long list that James has just put a comment about. 
um, that, that is just really trying to understand what, what is going on out there, um, what are the model researchers developing. Uh, from that list, we're going to be able to work out which ones are going to come onto the aid and flip platforms next. I'm really trying to sort of strive towards that holy grail, which is that aid and flip can release specifications back to the model researchers that we're not having to keep on changing those two systems, but they can become more of an authority. Um, and, and that's, uh, I think, a really great analogy by Harris is more like a de developing an app. We can get the specifications out. Everyone's doing it to the same way. And, th and then we can start seeing the, the pathways and models flow through into aid and, and uh, flip. We've mentioned HET, uh, that's uh, 28th and 29th September over at the Excel in London. Um, both Harris and, and Beverly Bryant will be there um, doing various discussions. So it'd be great to see any of you there. Um, a few of us will be attending. Happy to talk to any of you. Come and find us. Um, and uh, the last deadline to talk to you about is, is the next big development deadline, which is uh, the FLIP MVP. So this is the end of November um, going live into both KCH and UCLH. We've had to do two trusts for FLIP MVP because it's test rating, uh, testing the, the federated learning aspect of FLIP. Um, so yeah, we, we hit um, November there. There'll be another demo like, like this of FLIP, um, presumably sometime towards the end of the next year or early, uh, towards the end of this year or early next year. Um, and, then, and then we really crack on with onboarding onboarding more trusts and onboarding uh, more pathways and models onto the two systems. Uh, that's everything for me, Louise. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, yeah, that was really useful to understand um, those next steps, I think, and, and all those um, communities that are being established. So please get in touch. And um, like I said, this session has been recorded. So if you think any of your colleagues would be interested in taking a look at the whole 42 minutes, um, please um, send an email to Lucy via the email in the chat and we can um, we can send you a link to that. Um, I don't know if any of the team have any closing comments, but I'm delighted to give you um, a number of minutes back of your day. If not, um, thank you all for joining. Uh, anybody got any closing comments, Lucy? No, just thanks to everyone for coming and um, we'll also be showing this demo to anyone else who wants to have a look. We're really keen to get everyone's feedback and just sort of show as many people as possible, um, especially as we go through different iterations. So, yeah, thanks a lot for coming and we're looking forward to sort of deploying it in all the other trusts as well. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody, and um, catch up soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.